Hello, Rob. Welcome. Um, Rob is going to talk to us about making Kubernetes how we build things. Um, and take it away, Rob. Thank you very much. Marvelous. So here's the part where I share a big slide deck and bore you. No, I'm just kidding. This is my one and only slide. This is going to be a no slides demo of lots of really cool developer time container tools. Now, typically we look at container tools in production, or maybe we consider it a, an implementation detail of our DevOps pipeline. Uh, now I'm developing on Windows and deploying on Linux, and so I may get surprised. Let's look at some tools that will help me to start easier, to run differently, to build faster, to visualize the contents of our containers and our cluster, and to debug content within containers. We'll look at lots of these tools that allow us to do really interesting things. Double click on my desktop and you'll be able to make it full screen as we dig in deep into all these things. So first up, running differently. I have here a container. Here's my application and in this case it's a node app and it's gonna go grab an environment variable and display that message. I have a Docker file that will build up my container. Pretty standard stuff. Now I get greeted with the command line. Docker build dash T. Oh, what was the name of it again? Okay, so now I've got the build command done. Docker run dash P 3000 colon 3000. Did I get that port right? Dash E message. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a lot going on here, a lot that I don't want to have to deal with. I haven't even specified the name of the container yet. Hello world v0.1. That's all a mouthful. We just did a build. We just did a run. Can we get all of these things in one spot? Docker compose up. Now this is an easy one, but it'll help us get our uh, fingers wet here. Docker compose up allows us to do some really cool things. Here in this Docker Compose YAML file, we specify all of the build arguments and all of the runtime arguments. So we just have to say Docker Compose up, we don't have to remember anything. And now if I browse to localhost colon 3000, then I've got my app. This is perfect. That was a lot easier than trying to remember all the things. Docker composed down, and now this application is done. Now, one of the things that's kind of interesting is by default, Docker compose will start a, oh, not up, Docker composed down. By default, Docker compose will start a new network, and that makes it so that if you have two Docker Compose files, they won't be able to share resources. Now, maybe that's the desired effect, but here's a, a line that'll allow us to say network mode bridge. That won't create a new network, and so that's perfect. Now I can have one Docker Compose file for my database. I can have another Docker Compose file for those portions of my application that I don't need to worry about. I may even have a Docker Compose file for downstream components and they can all share the same default Docker network. This was perfect. Next up, let's look at alternate runtimes. So by default, Docker Desktop is great. It is the easy button. Now, when I'm in Docker Desktop, I do have a checkbox that ena enables me to turn on Kubernetes mode. And so now I can either work in Docker mode or I can work in Kubernetes mode and that works great. But there's alternate runtimes. Maybe I use Minikube, or maybe I use Micro K8S, or maybe I use K3S. Each of these have different mechanisms that allow me to do more things, or maybe kind. Now, Docker Desktop is definitely the easy button. <laughs> it will automatically proxy things back and forth. But for example, Minikube allows me to show all of the native containers and allows me to map ports back and forth. So I just start with minikube start, and I may pass in additional parameters. Once I have minikube running, I have a regular virtual machine 
that I can get at. So Minikube IP. Here's the IP address of my Minikube VM. Minikube Docker ENV. Here are the environment variables that I need to set in my shell so that I can get at my Docker details. So I've already set these environment variables. Docker image list. Here's all the things that I have loaded in my cluster. Docker container list. Now you see that we have not only our regular containers, but we also have the Kubernetes control plane. That's really cool. Except for sometimes I only want to get at the content that I built. I noticed that all of these containers start with K and S. So Docker container list, pipe it to grep minus V for K and S. And now these are only the containers that I started. And in this case, there aren't any. Minikube is a great alternate runtime. I still need to have Docker installed to be able to build content. But for example, I'm going to start it up disabled. Now I can use Minikube as my alternate runtime. Minikube is a little bit gentler with nested virtualization. Minikube for me starts more reliably in unusual situations. And for example, I have this Minikube environment and this Minikube environment and this Minikube environment, and they're all separate. They all work in different ways. This is perfect. Minikube or Kind or K3S may be a good alternate runtime if Docker Desktop isn't meeting your needs. Next up, Docker Watch. Now, it's interesting to start up things in containers. We may want to run a .NET watch or an NPM watch so that anytime we change code, immediately we'll get a new build of our thing. How could we do that in containers? Well, Scaffold is that tool. Scaffold will watch all of the directories in our files, and Scaffold will rebuild push and start our containers on the host of our choice. So we start off with scaffold in it and that will scaffold out our uh, our scaffold our uh, scaffold.yaml file and that tells us the details that we need. I've tweaked mine to build this hello node container and to start it based on this kds yaml file. Here in this kds yaml file, we just have the normal things, a deployment, a service, It'll start on port 3000, and it's just going to build up my server.js. So here, uh, here in my terminal, it's running on port 3000. Let's go run that, Minikube 3000, and here's our website. Oh, you know what? It's running in Kubernetes, so let's go look at stuff. kubectl get all. It's running a node port, here we go. So it's running on port 30,814. Okay, so Minikube 30,814, and here's our, our content. Well, now if I wanna go change it, instead of hello world, hello API dev days, API days, Australia. I'm gonna push save. And instantly, my container starts rebuilding. It's doing all the things. It's going to deploy. And all of this happens behind the scenes. So when I'm ready, I just come back to this page, and I push refresh. And I push refresh. Ha <laughs> Did I get a new node port? Uh, cube CTL get all. 30814. I push refresh in my browser, and now I have my new content. I didn't have to do all of the Docker build, Docker push, Docker deploy. It does take a little bit for it to build the container, and so that's where we may want to work diligently with the layers in our Docker file to ensure that they're smooth. But this is a really good way to automatically Docker watch, <laughs> coining that term, to build containers automatically when code changes. That was cool. Next up, let's go uh, clean up out of this. Docker system prune.
So next up, let's look at ways that we can visualize. Now, in this case, we're going to, ooh, uh, not dash, dive. Dive. We're going to look at the contents of our container. Now, if we're looking at the contents of our container, we definitely could do something like uh, Docker history, hello node, v0.1. And it will show us all of the commands that got us to this point in our container. Well, we did this, and then we did this. But these are truncated, and we don't have a good sense of what files are, are created where. And that's where we'll look to Dive. Dive is a console application that will allow us to explore the contents of our containers. So let's fire up Dive on this container. It does take a second to pull it down. But now I can kind of wander through here are all of the files that are in this directory. Let's close that folder, close that folder. So we can kind of get a sense of what happens here. I'll hit tab to go back to this list. Now I added this one. Next, I'll do this. Well, here's where my Docker file starts. It worked our app and nothing changed. Oh, well, actually we did. We have this folder here. It's green. That's perfect. Next up, ooh, I see in my app directory, I don't just have server.js. I have some more content that I didn't expect. I don't need my Docker file and my Docker Compose file inside my container. Well, let's come back to our container and let's adjust this Docker file. Perhaps rather than copying everything, we only copy server.js. Or perhaps I need to adjust my docker ignore to ignore more files. This was possible because I was able to see the content here with uh, Dive. So hit Control C and we're back out of it. Dive was a great way to visualize the contents of a container. How would we visualize our docker things? Docker image list. Docker container list. Those are kind of hard to remember. And what is it? So let's take a look at this. Docker com uh, CD. Docker compose up. Actually, dash F. Let's start up Portainer. Well, what is Portainer? Portainer is this really cool dashboard that allows us to visualize the contents of our Docker cluster. It new in Portainer 2.0, we could also visualize the contents from a Kubernetes perspective too. But this dashboard allows us to see really cool things. So let's come to uh, localhost colon 9000. Now we haven't created a user yet, so let's give it a password password, because this is the first time we've launched Portainer. And now what do we want to administer? Well, in this case, we want to administer our local cluster. It'll tell us we need to uh, map the uh, Docker socket. Yep, we've already done that with our Docker Compose file. And now we can dig in and take a look at our cluster. So let's look at our containers. Uh, let's launch a new container. Com Close up. So this will start our hello node container, and that'll be really cool. Let's refresh this page, and we'll see our new container is right there. That was perfect. We could discover it, and we could dig into it and take a look at it. Here's the Docker logs. And so there's the console output of my application. No more guessing about what the commands were. Did it run correctly? One of the things that I think is brilliant here is I can also attach to a console. Now, in this case, I'm running based on Alpine, so I don't have Bash, but let me switch over to a shell, and I will connect. And now I am inside that container. LS, did my container not start up correctly? Well, let me try it. Node server.js. Well, of course, that port's already in use, so this is going to fail. But that's a great way to start to debug and understand more about our running containers. Exit, and I'm back out. So now I've kind of done some bad things. Let's 
stop this container. Let's remove this container. And all of that is possible here from the dashboard. I didn't need to remember any weird things. Now, because Docker Compose started this in a second, it's actually going to start it back up. <laughs> so let's go kill this one. Uh, Docker Compose down, not own. <laughs> Docker Compose down. And we will kill off Portainer as well. Docker Compose down. Oh, yes. Now, what if instead of uh, Docker mode, I want to look at it more in Kubernetes mode? So let's start up K dash. Now, K dash is a great alternate Kubernetes dashboard. Kubernetes does come with a dashboard. Eh. Do you like that dashboard or would you like a different one? Maybe you could choose Portainer or maybe you could use KDS dash. Let's see what uh, node port our KDS dash got. Ooh, 30316. Let's go grab that and pull up KDS dash. Now, the first thing it's going to do is invite me to log in. To do that, I come in here to uh, KDS dash, and it talks all about logging in. This is perfect. I already have that secret created, so let me grab that here and log in. Now, once inside this dashboard, I can take a look at, for example, the namespaces. I'll go into the default namespace. Here's the things that are running. I can see all the history of the hello node container. Here's um, the KDS dash content, so I can dig into one of these. Here's the pods. Here's the um, logs for the pods. I like digging in here. If we go into accounts and we go into secrets, did you know that there were all these secrets running in your cluster? That's pretty cool. KDS dash is a great way to start to visualize the details inside your cluster. So next up, debugging. Now, it would be interesting to try and start our container and try and dig into it. But uh, we have here VS Code. And VS Code, if I've loaded the remoting extension, I can do interesting things like remote into WSL, remote into SSH. In this case, I'm going to remote into containers. Once I have that extension loaded, I click here, and I'm going to say, try a sample. Now I can pick from the language that I find most convenient to light up a sample where I can dig in to do all the things. Well, I've already got a sample loaded, so let's uh, load up this folder. And the first thing it does when I launch VS Code with this folder loaded is it prompts me down here and it says, would you like to reload this in a container? I notice you have all the things set to do so. Why, yes, I would. Let's reopen this in a container. Now, what it's going to do is, it's, is VS Code is actually splitting in two pieces. So there's the VS Code that is the UI that is running on my machine. And there's the VS Code that's embedded in the container or that remote environment that allows me to do interesting things. So this is inside the container doing all of the editing. And this is outside the container where I have all of my extensions and I have my uh, content. But this one will have all my language extensions so I can get my uh, in, uh, language preferences. And the two halves work seamlessly together. If I want, I can take a look at the container starting. Here it is. It's firing up a container, and it's attaching me into that container. Well, how did it know the details of how to start that container? In a minute, we'll see it start up correctly. Actually, while it's starting up, let's take a look at that. Here inside this dot dev container folder, I have a dev container.json. 
This dev container.json specifies the details about how I am to start this container. It's looking for a Docker file. It gives me some post uh, install commands. In this case, I'm going to do an npm install. I can specify ports that I would like forwarded. Because I'm using Minikube, I've already got my uh, workspace bound here with this um, network connection. And I'm forwarding ports automatically to this container. So let's check back in and see if it's started. Nope. I may be crashing out of this demo. But this container allows me to forward ports in. So I'm using VS Code like I always would. I'm just doing it inside of a container. I don't need to install that latest framework. I don't need to install the next language. I can do that um, inside the container as, instead. Let me see if I can start this again. I may have to concede this is a demo fail. Yep, I'm going to concede that as a demo fail. But this gives me some really elegant ways to start to debug and edit and develop inside of a container. I get a shell that exactly matches my container. I get um, I can run exactly in context. And if I have any differences in the way I build my app, like for example, I'm going to pull in Git so I can commit out of my container, and all of those pieces just fit into place. Because I'm using Minikube, I'm going to tell it where my Docker host is, and it'll just plug in all the details to make that work. So we saw a bunch of mechanisms for how to build, build differently, uh, debug, visualize, all of these pieces that allow us as developers to take control of our containerized workloads and do some really elegant things. What are our questions? Hi, Rob. That was a great presentation. Really good and informative. Thank you very much for that. Um, just let me check the questions. So I know you are, OK. Is there a step-by-step -step guide to do this presentation and redo it at home? That is a great question. I haven't put this into a blog post, but it sounds like there's some interest in that, so I'll definitely make that a priority. Thanks for the suggestion. Awesome. I know you are very, very uh, enthusiastic about Kubernetes, but what do you think would be a wrong time to use Kubernetes? Kubernetes is generally a little bit weird. So it may make sense to start off with Docker Swarm and kind of get your feet wet in containers and then move over to Kubernetes later if you find that a simpler way to go. Alternatively, Kubernetes is the one that is gaining the most traction. So it may be time to start straight away. If you have a monolithic application and you want to get it into microservices, if you're looking at containers at all, then uh, Kubernetes might be a good thing to start up. You'll probably find a great way to start Kubernetes clusters in most in every public cloud and most private clouds. So I suspect that you may not be burdened by administering a Kubernetes cluster if you don't want to. That's great. Um... I think there's no more questions. Thank you very much, Rob. Great. If you find questions in an hour or tomorrow, grab me here at the conference or tweet me at Rob underscore Rich or go to robrich.org and click on the email button and send me an email. I'd love to continue the conversation. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Rob.